Hi there, and welcome from Ventura, California, to today's webinar, Galileo, at the dawn of a new age of GNSS services, sponsored by Novatel inside GNSS and inside Unmanned Systems, and hosted by WebAttract, the leaders in educational webinars. I'm Lori Dearman, Senior Webinar Producer with WebAttract, and I'll be one of your moderators for today's session. And in just a moment, we'll be introducing our panel of thought leaders, as today's webinar is about hearing from these experts as they discuss what the December 15th Declaration of Galileo Initial Services means for product designers, systems integrators, manufacturers, service providers, and users. You'll also have an opportunity to have your questions answered at midpoint and at the end of the presentation during the Ask the Expert panel session with all four of our panelists today. Now today we've invited you along with over 700 professionals from 57 countries uh, representing a variety of industries. And over the next 90 minutes, regardless of your industry segment or your location, we're confident that you'll find today's webinar of value. Before we get started, Glenn Gibbons, editor and publisher at Inside GNSS, would like to take a moment to welcome you and introduce Demos Geber Xavier, who will be moderating the main portion of today's webinar. So over to you, Glenn. Well, thank you, Lloyd. And on behalf of the Inside GNSS team, including our publisher, Richard Fisher, and myself, I want to add our welcome to our international audience for today's web seminar. Last week's declaration of Galileo Initial Services has been particularly satisfying for me. In late 1999, I launched a publication called Galileo's World, which covered the progress of what was then Europe's just announced program to develop its own global navigation satellite system. After a few years producing the magazine through the early ups and downs of the Galileo program, Richard and I decided that we might have been a little ahead of the market. But we never lost our enthusiasm for the project, and we are delighted to see Europe's perseverance paying off today. We have an excellent panel and set of presentations for you, and they will give you the most current and authoritative information available on the status and plans for Galileo. So now I want to turn the webinar over to today's moderator, Demos Gebre Egziaber. Over the years, Demos has helped develop and moderate many inside GNSS webinars, and he's especially close to today's topic, having just returned from the European Space Agency's Navitech 2016 conference in the Netherlands. In his day job, Demos is on the faculty of the Aerospace Engineering and Mechanics Department at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities, USA. There, he teaches and researches positioning, navigation, and timing-related issues. His research deals with the use of GNSS in transportation applications and the design of multi-sensor navigation and attitude determination systems for aerospace vehicles. Demos holds a PhD in aeronautics and astronautics from Stanford University. Demos, thank you for joining us again for today's event. Glenn, thank you very much for that introduction and uh, welcome everyone out there joining us on this webinar today. Uh, glad you could join us. So to get going, let's start out with a quick poll here. And uh, Lori, if you could bring up the poll question. Absolutely, yes. Uh, coming up on, uh, on everyone's screen, you should see the question as of today. How many Galileo satellites are in orbit? Is it uh, 4, 8, 18, 22, or 26? So it looks like 5% uh, saying 4, 19% saying 8, majority here 63 saying 18, 9% uh, of our audience saying 22, and 4% saying 26. Uh, demos? Nice spread of answers, uh, and you know what, I will wait for the next speaker to tell you what the answer for that uh, question is, and let me introduce uh, our first panelist, uh, who will be uh, answering that question in part. Our first panelist is Marco Lissi, who serves as the GNSS Service Engineering Manager at the European Space Agency in the Directorate of Galileo Program and Navigation Related Activities. In this position, he's responsible for engineering and exploitation of services based on the European navigation infrastructures, Galileo and EGNOS also advises the executive director of the European GNSS agency, GSA. After getting a doctorate in engineering, summa cum laude, at the University of Rome, he worked for more than 30 years in the aerospace and telecommunications sectors, covering managerial positions in R&D, engineering, and programs, both in industry and institutional organizations. Marco, glad you could join us today, and I'm going to turn it over to you. 
Okay, thank you Demos for your introduction and hello to everybody in the webinar. Uh, my name is Marco Lisi, I work for the European Space Agency as Demos uh, already introduced. Today I will give you a short introduction to the Galileo system and its present status uh, just after the initial service declaration. Before doing that, let us watch together the video of the last launch of four Galileo satellites on 17th November come down in French and now we, you see the, the Ariane 5 launcher. Now this launch is particularly important in the history of Galileo and of all GNSS systems in general because for the first time four spacecraft were put in orbit all together by an Ariane 5 launcher. A perfect, I would say beautiful launch as you can see. All four satellites are now reaching their final orbital slots and they will start soon the commissioning phase. Some basic information about Galileo. Galileo is the European initiative to provide Europe with a highly accurate and autonomous positioning, navigation and timing infrastructure. While being fully autonomous, Galileo will also be interoperable with other existing GNSS such as GPS. The Galileo system implementation developed in two phases, the in-orbit validation or IOB phase and the full operational capability or FOC phase. In its final configuration, the Galileo system will consist of 30 satellites, 24 plus 6 active spare, and of a supporting ground infrastructure. The Galileo system provides a number of services based on different signals in space. The open service and the public re regulated service are similar respectively to the GPS standard positioning service and the GPS precise positioning service. The Galileo specific commercial service delivers authentication and high accuracy positioning and timing for commercial applications. The search and rescue service, being part of the Coastal Sarsat organization, helps locating people in distress. If you need more information on the carrier frequencies and modulations, this information is available in a slide that is part of the handout of this presentation. Now this slide shows a very top level view of the Galileo system architecture. The constellation of satellites in orbit is supported on ground by a worldwide network of stations, sensor stations, uplink stations, and TTNC stations, and by a number of centers, all connected by highly reliable, secure, and redundant communication lines. The Galileo ground infrastructure is in fact a large and complex information and communication technology system. The Galileo constellation is similar to the GPS one, but not exactly the same. There will be 24 satellites in orbit, 8 for each of the three orbital planes, plus 6 active spare satellites, 2 for each orbital plane. The satellites will orbit around the Earth at an altitude of about 23,000 kilometers. The orbital planes have an inclination of 55, 56 degrees with regard to the equator. This slide gives you a, an artist impression of an FOC satellite in orbit. The Galileo satellites are not very big, about 700 kilograms of launch mass. They have a primary power capability of about 2 kilowatts. And they are designed to last 12 years in operation. Visible in the picture are the, micro, the array of microstrip patches transmitting until band and a smaller array of helixes receiving at UHF for the search and rescue mission. The true art of the Galileo satellites consists of four atomic clocks, two passive hydrogen measures with a stability of 0.5 nanoseconds in 12 hours that corresponds to one second over three million years. So far they are the most stable clocks ever flown in space and two rubidium clocks with a stability of three seconds over one million years. Just for the sake of comparison, a good quality quartz wristwatch has a typical stability of one second per year. 
The next three slides summarize the present status of the constellation. A constantly updated situation of the constellation of Galileo satellites is available on the Galileo Service Center website that will be presented later by another speaker. It is worth noting that the two satellites put in orbit with the Soyuz launch on the 24th of May this year have completed their commissioning test and they are fully operational, so they, are, they became part of the initial service constellation. The last four satellites launched on the 17th of November are reaching their final orbital slots to then start the commissioning phase. They should be completed by June next year. They will join the initial service constellation in two batches, in April and June next year. The slide shows the past and planned launch schedule. Two double Soyuz launches with IOB spacecraft in 2011 and 2012. Then five double Soyuz launches with FOC spacecraft and the quadruple Ariane 5 launch in November this year to be followed by two more quadruple launches in 2017 and 2018. The Galileo ground segment. This slide give you, gives you an idea of the worldwide extension and complexity of the Galileo ground segment. Note that the various stations are often placed at very remote sites, at all longitudes and latitudes. And you can imagine the complexity also of the logistics and the maintenance of these remote sites. A number of Galileo centers are spread all over Europe. The European GNSS Agency in Prague, that is the headquarters where all services and operations are organized and managed. Two control centers, one in Italy and one in Germany. Two low Earth orbit phase centers that, that gives support after launch in France and Germany. Two security and PRS centers in England and France one in orbit testing IoT center in Belgium, one Galileo service center in Spain, an integrated logistics center in Belgium. In this center, a centralized management and all the engineering activities related to the logistics of Galileo, maintenance, spare parts, configuration management, will be performed. And the Galileo reference centers in the Netherlands, meant to provide an independent monitoring of the signal in space quality and of the service KPI, key performance indicators. The slide shows the two Galileo control centers, one at Fucino in Italy top and one in Oberfarfenhofen, Germany bottom. The two centers are fully redundant and will control with different primary roles the constellation of satellites and the ground segment. In this slide, instead, is shown the Galileo Service Center in Madrid. The Galileo Service Center will interface with the world of users and of the upstream services and applications. The Search and Rescue Service has got its own dedicated ground segment with the control center in Toulouse and three main MIOLAT ground stations, one at the Spitsbergen Island in northern Norway, one at Maspalomas in the Canary Islands and one uh, in Larnaga in the Cyprus Island. Three uh, uh, very uh, nice location, uh, either very warm or very cold, I should say. And as you can see, uh, here I have summarized the evolution of the Galileo program. We started with different elements or building blocks, satellites, ground stations, ground centers. Then the Galileo evolved into a self-consistent system. Since last week, the Galileo system, surrounded by a service-oriented infrastructure, is able to deliver the initial service to the world. And that's it for now, and uh, thank you for your attention, and back to you, Demos. Thank you very much, Marco. All right, so moving forward, let me introduce our next panelist, who's uh, Jeremy Godet, who is the head of the sector for the Galileo implementation at the European Commission. Uh, previously, he served as head of security department at the European GNSS Agency, GSA, and as the European Commission's security signal and frequency team leader on the Galileo program. He was the chairman of the Galileo Signal Task Force. 
Uh, he graduated from the École Nationale Supérieure de Telecommunication in Bretagne, France, and he received his Master's of Science degree from the International Space University. Jeremy? Thank you, Deimos, for the introduction. And thank you to give me the opportunity to present some details about what Galileo offers during the initial service phase. In October uh, this year, the European Commission presented a new space strategy for Europe, which puts the focus on delivering services and space-based application to everyone's benefits. It fosters competitiveness and innovation of upstream and downstream space industry in Europe. It defines space as a strategic tool for Europe's autonomy, including the autonomous access to space, and promotes international co cooperation. Together with the European Earth Observation Programme Copernicus, the European SBAS EGNOS, and of course since last week with the Galileo Initial Service, Europe is delivering on this vision. Since the 15th of December last week, Galileo offers three services. A free of charge worldwide open service, which is fully interoperable with GPS and other GNSS. A public regulated service, the access of which is worldwide but is authorized and controlled by competent authorities in the member states and is for governmental, including security related use. And finally, a support to search and rescue service under the umbrella of the COSPA SARSAT organization. It is free and global coverage and allows to locate emergency beacons and communicate the distress to search and rescue centers. In the last nine months, uh, the infrastructure was thoroughly tested and has shown excellent performances. Using a subset of the constellation, not yet including the four satellites launched last November with Ariane 5, and to be precise, 11 satellites for the open service and the PRS, and 12 for the search and rescue, Galileo offers measured 95 percentile performances in the order of 0.8 meters for the ranging average, 3 and 8 meters horizontal and vertical accuracy when associated with a, a position dilution of precision below 6. It provides better than 10 nanoseconds universe, universal time coordinate reference dissemination and around 7 nanoseconds for GPS Galileo time offset. And finally, a probability of location of a distress within 10 minutes, which is above 98%. The condition under which the initial services are delivered are described in the service definition documents. These are performance standards, which are defined regardless of any particular applications, and they are based on minimum performance levels. And as more satellites are being commissioned and launched, the performance level will improve and the document will be updated accordingly. The open service and the search and rescue SDD can be downloaded from the GSC website, and I will detail them in the next slides. So this slide is an extract of the open service SDD, as you can see, the minimum performance level consists in accuracy and availability key performance indicators. There is as well information concerning the notice advisory to Galileo users, so-called NAGU, a complementary info published in the GSC website on top of the flags that are directly available to, to the users through the signal in space. So the open service in this initial phase provides mainly a ranging service and a timing service. The ranging, the ranging service with an accuracy better than 7 meter for the worst satellite and 2 meter for the constellation average is interoperable with GPS ranging services and therefore it provides a direct benefit to users who are able to exploit both Galileo and GPS constellations by increasing the number of available signals in space. The timing service allows users all over the world to very accurately synchronize their clocks to the universal time-coordinated reference 
with an accuracy better than 30 nanoseconds. And on, on top of it, a precise time offset between the Galileo and GPS system time is provided. This allows users to determine a first position fix by using a mix of, for example, two Galileo satellites and two GPS satellites. And it is the first time such system time offset is offered by any satellite navigation system on a global basis. Galileo offers from day one multiple frequency signal equivalent to the GPS Block 3 modernization. There are up to three frequencies available for the open service. The E1 frequency, which is the equivalent to GPS L1, E5A, which is the equivalent to GPS L5, and E5B, which is also used by the Chinese Beidou system and in the future by GLONASS. And for the moment, we have one dedicated test signal for the commercial service in the E6 frequency. As such, this is the first open service SDD with a worldwide coverage and multiple frequencies. And there are also two frequencies for the PRS. Concerning the Galileo Search and Rescue Initial Service, it offers a COSPASASAT MIOSAR ground segment early operational capability, the EOC, over the SAR Galileo service coverage, as well as a global space component coverage. This initial service was endorsed by COSPASASAT Council uh, decision earlier this month, and the MIOSAR EOC is based on Galileo L-band SAR repeaters on the satellites and GPS S-band experimental repeaters as well as a number of ground antennas called the MEOLUTS, which are deployed by the various contributing nations. From the EOC to the full operational capability, the evolution will be that we will have a full space segment coverage with the operational L-band SAR repeaters. So this slide is an extract of the, the search and rescue SDD. And as you can see, generally, this, the minimum performance level consists in the probability of detection and location within a certain time and with or without a certain location accuracy. The Galileo SAR minimum performance level are mirroring the COSPASARSAT MIOSAR KPIs, except for the detection of or the location time of 10 minutes which corresponds already to the FOC target, while at the stage on, of the EOC, COSPASARSAT only requires 20 minutes. These key performance indicators are available within the search and rescue Galileo service coverage, which was earlier described by Marco Lisi, where it is also worth mentioning that the actual measured performance are already above the MIOSA FOC targets for all the key performance indicators. So now search and rescue is much faster from up to three hours with the previous LEOSAR coverage down to 10 minutes with the new MIOSAR. And we all know how much time is important when it comes to saving people's lives. It is also now more accurate from 10 kilometers down to 5 kilometers. And all of this is achieved even without changing the existing user equipment on board ships or plane. And actually, just two minutes after the start of the operation last week of the French Mission Control Center on the 13th of December, only two minutes after, already one alert was detected using the Galileo space signal. And, and since last week, already 300 alerts were detected and localized using the MIOSA. So Galileo initial service declaration is just the first step towards the reaching the full operational capability of Galileo by the end of 2020. More satellites remain to be launched to complete the constellation. The new operation contract actually starts tomorrow and aims at ensuring that performance are maintained. We call it the service operator or the GSOP, and it will be managed by the GSA. In 2018, a number of service, a new service will be introduced. 
First, the Open Service Navigation Message Authentication, which will provide a digital signature of the open service for increased robustness to spoofing. The Commercial Service High Accuracy, aiming at improving the accuracy of positioning down to centimeters level. And finally, a search and rescue return link, which will acknowledge the reception of the distress to the hand users. There will be as well a number of improvements. The open service navigation message uh, will be improved in terms of time to fix, robustness, synchronization for LBS, using the available spare bits of the navigation message in a fully backward compatible manner. And finally, an action plan will be implemented to facilitate the uptake in the different sectors of the economy and make Galileo available for use in EU policies. Thank you very much and over to you, Daniels. Thank you very much, uh, Jeremy. All right, so we will pause at this point and take some uh, questions from our audience uh, for the panelists. And so to do that, let me uh, start off with my first question for, um, this one will be for you, um, uh, Marco. And it's the question is uh, basically, can you uh, tell us uh, something a little bit more about the 18 satellites that are on orbit today that are healthy? Um, I mean, are all of them healthy, or uh, what's the status of uh, of, um, of their uh, of their general uh, performance? Yeah. Okay, Demos. Thank you for the question. So as explained also by Jeremini's presentation. Uh, at the moment, uh, as part of the initial service constellation, we have 11 satellites for open service and 12 for uh, search and rescue. Why? Because the last four satellites uh, are still reaching their orbital slots, so they should not be counted. They will be available uh, next year in June. And the two satellites in the past uh, suffered a launch problem, uh, so they were eventually placed on the slightly wrong orbits and we are not considering them fully operational. We are still investigating about possible uses of those satellites but at the moment they are not not being fully functional. They'll, they are perfectly working but in the wrong orbit so we do not consider them as part of the initial service. And then out of the remaining 12, uh, one satellite has got some problems about uh, the some signal in space related to open service, so uh, it, but the, uh, the search and rescue uh, payload they said works uh, well. So there are 12 satellites operational for search and rescue, 11 in fact, 11 payloads uh, operational for uh, and part of initial service for uh, for open service. Thank you, Marco. Uh, Jeremy, anything you would like to add to that, or do you think uh, Marco got everything you wanted to? Um, yeah. We are currently testing the two uh, elliptical orbit satellites. As you know, they are used for the search and rescue, to, and they are part of the initial service for the search and rescue. The tests we are doing are in terms of performance, uh, and the decision will be taken next year whether to, to use, this, use them for the open uh, service. Uh, what will uh, be uh, important is that we will, we will not uh, require any specific uh, signal processing in the receiver to make them available. They should be really available in a fully transparent manner as any other satellites if it is decided to, to go forward. All right. Thank you. Uh, this next question is for you, Jeremy, and it's on the uh, positional accuracies that you reported. Uh, is the three meter horizontal that you reported, is that in real time or is that in um, after uh, some post processing? Or this is real time. This is real time. Okay. All right. Uh, another question. Uh, again, this one I'll start with you, Jeremy, but uh, if the others could uh, uh, chime in afterwards, that's okay. It's, uh, and I think. Uh, question was asked before, uh, got to your slides to answer it, but I'll ask the question regardless. Uh, why only one launch each in 2017 and 2018? Okay, I guess so they're probably talking about the launch of the launches and not satellites per se. But So in the last uh, two years we launched uh, 12 satellites, so it's, that's uh, an average of six satellites per year. 
and the next two years we will launch four satellites per year. And at the moment, uh, the eight remaining satellites to be launched, they are already in the production line. Some of them actually already have been uh, uh, finalized and tested, and some of some other are in the production. But we don't have currently more than eight satellites in production. This will depend on a new contract which we are about to sign early next year. And they will come a bit later uh, in 2020 time frame. Right. Uh, thanks, uh, Jeremy. Uh, does do any of the other panelists uh, want to add anything to this? All right. Let's see, next question. Um, to, uh, this one is to you, Marco. Um, so in the presentations you and Jeremy made, you indicate that there are going to be different types of services, ground, uh, marine, um, air. Um, are there any applications that are uh, space-based that you're aware of uh, where Galileo will be used in the near future? Or can you say anything about the space applications of Galileo? Yeah, thank you. This is a good question and I like it very much. So it is well known that the GNSS signals can be used for the LEO, uh, MEO and the GEO satellite uh, orbits and uh, there have been many, several studies also to, to see the feasibility of using Earth GNSS uh, on the Moon. And uh, the, the reality is that uh, the signal uh, without using uh, special receivers and special processing is use useful up to two-thirds of the distance between Earth and Moon. Nonetheless, we have been studying uh, at ESA the possibility of using uh, the GNSS in general, Galileo specifically, signals on the Moon to synchronize stations, uh, let's say ground, uh, moon stations, let's put it this way, and uh, to create a local network uh, for navigation and communication. And there was a, a recently a paper of mine presented at Navitech, a workshop here at TESC just a few days ago, that was just about this infrastructure on the moon to support the well-known idea of our director general, Moon Village. So we are sh surely studying the possibility of using GNSS also for space applications, LEO, GEO, MEO, and even uh, and even on the moon. All right, thank you uh, very much uh, for that answer. Uh, let's see, other webinar uh, panelists I haven't introduced you, but Peter, um, Fiametta, anything you want to say on that? All right, I. Uh, Okay, uh, let's see, and probably we got uh, one more question we could ask before we need to move on, and, um, and this one is uh, for you, Jeremy, uh, and it, uh, the question is, is the Commission um, in talks with other governments, say for example the U.S., uh, for uh, access to the uh, publicly regulated service? Uh, can other, say, non-EU countries get access to it? Yes, they must. Uh, the European Legal Framework offers the possibility to grant access to PRS to uh, non-EU non countries, but it is for the Council of the EU to decide whether the conditions to do so are met at the end of the negotiation process. And uh, the Council adopted negotiation mandates earlier this year in July uh, for talks with the United States and with Norway. And the strong interest of the US and Norway to already start negotiation, although Galileo is not yet fully operational, is, is a very positive sign for us. All right. So with that, I think we should move on to the uh, second half of our webinar here. So to do that, poll, uh, we'll start with a poll question. Laurie, if you could bring up the second poll question. Sure. Uh, coming up on the screen is that second question, and uh, we'd like to hear from each of you. Approximately how many major vendors provide Galileo-capable receivers today? Is it 3, 10, 17, 30, or none? So 19% saying 3, our majority here 48% saying 10, 18% indicating 17. 13% of our audience said 30, and 2% uh, of our audience said none. Uh, Demos, any thoughts on these responses? 
Okay, again, as like the first poll question, I think a lot of our audience are going to be surprised I was when I uh, first realized how many um, Galileo Kepler receivers are out there today. And that uh, question will get answered by the presentation of our next uh, panelist, uh, who is uh, Fiametta Diani. Uh, she is the uh, Deputy Head of Market Development at the European GNSS Agency, GSA, where she has worked since 2009. Uh, before joining the GSA, she worked in the private sector for more than 10 years in both aerospace and information techno technology industries and gained a lot of experience in the application of space-based technology for the transport sector. Uh, she holds a Master Degree in Aerospace Engineering from Politecnico di Milano and a postgraduate master in economics and business administration of governmental and not-for-profit organizations from the University of Ferrara in Italy. Uh, Fiametta, we're glad you could join us today and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Demos, for the introduction. So good morning or good evening to our attendees, wherever you are. Uh, so. Um, what I want to tell you um, about Galileo Initial Services is the point of view of the user. So what the Galileo Initial Services means uh, for the user and what is the readiness of receivers. That Galileo is ready to use, so we will see some application from smartphones to transport and also a short outlook on the future and the current R&D opportunities that we can offer for the companies who want to innovate in GNSS and use the differentiators of Galileo. So, first of all, uh, let me say that this moment is for us uh, a very important moment. It's a transition moment from the deployment phase uh, to the operational phase. Uh, and the 2017 will be for us the first year of full op the, in which we will be operating Galileo. And my agency is progressively managing this task uh, delegated by the European Commission, while the European Space Agency will continue its role uh, of system designer and development. But what are the initial services for the users? What do they mean? So we heard before that uh, we have an open service and uh, uh, the first advantage is better availability of satellite signal. So Galileo in combination with GPS, with which is compatible and interoperable, but also with the other GNSS, will immediately bring more satellites in view, especially in difficult environments, like the urban ones, where the satellites uh, may be blocked uh, by buildings. And this will mean for the user a better accuracy in the end. We, see, we saw with the, with the presentation of my colleague Jeremy about the improvement of search and rescue. So we go from three hours to 10 minutes and these uh, uh, alerts we received, you can imagine what this means in terms of uh, uh, search and rescue service. If also this come with a better accuracy in terms of position of the beacon in distress. And finally, Galileo will bring also a timing uh, signal. So for the infrastructure that rely on GNSS to be synchronized, uh, and they are in telecommunication, in power distribution, and in banking, the signal of Galileo will be already available from the initial services, because one satellite in view is sufficient uh, to get this signal for the users. But let's not forget that Galileo, since the initial services, will transmit not only on the main frequency E5, but also on a second frequency E5, that is the, uh, the same of uh, the GPS L5. So this will mean uh, some advantages in terms of accuracy, thanks to the ionospheric correction, increased robustness, uh, reducing the vulnerability uh, risk uh, of GNSS signals. And uh, we believe uh, that uh, L5 E5 is the second frequency of choice for the future, and we are not alone in this. We were at ION uh, earlier this year with the Broadcom, one major mass market manufacturer, uh, explaining uh, our view and these advantages. And also uh, E5 for its modulation will bring uh, mitigation of, uh, better mitigation of the multipath. And this is one of the local errors that more impact GNSS, especially for the new applications such as autonomous driving. We always, uh, we used to say that Galileo is a civil system under civil control, but what does it mean in practice? So one of the examples is the uh, GNSS Service Center, the one located in Madrid you heard about before. This is a single interface with the user. We have an help desk that uh, is already operating live, answering questions from manufacturers, from application developers, and also from users about Galileo. 
uh, we deliver the system status, the notification to the users, uh, and we treat the Galileo incident. Uh, and on this, uh, the website of this center, you will find all the documents that have been mentioned and are related uh, to Galileo signal and services. But one of the questions that uh, always uh, uh, I hear, and that was also proposed to you today, is, but can I use uh, Galileo in my receiver today? So at uh, GSA, we worked hard in the last years. In fact, you see here that in, in 2010, so a few years ago, only the three main uh, uh, manufacturers from Europe, STMicro in automotive, uh, Ublox and Septentrio, maybe because they were morally engaged, uh, they had Galileo. But today, in 2016, 17 major brands uh, of uh, receivers uh, you enable, are enabled to Galileo, and they represent 95% of the global supply. So I think this uh, uh, answer to the, to the poll, and uh, I think you should be a bit more optimistic. <laughs> So let me go to the application. So if these receivers are enabled, in which application we see that uh, they will uh, be embedded? So first of all, uh, we just published a new website. It's called usegalileo.eu. And here we listed all the products that are enabled to Galileo in the different application sectors, so from a road to sea, agriculture, and so on. So this is for the user that wants to see what are the products Galileo enabled, but also for the companies that are online today. If you, your product is not there yet, please contact us. It will be listed. And also, it will be updated with all the new products uh, that will come uh, from next year. And we are proud to say that we already have in the market uh, the first European smartphone that uh, is uh, enabled to Galileo. It's uh, BQ Aquarius, and uh, it has on board a Qualcomm uh, chipset, and you can uh, today, after the initial services, already track the Galileo satellites uh, in the smartphone. But Galileo will not go only in smartphone. Uh, all the new model of cars uh, that will be sold in Europe from April 2018 will have uh, onboard Galileo. In fact, uh, uh, this is thanks to the emergency call initiative that uh, uh, foresee a box inside every new car uh, that will send emergency call with position in case of accident. And this uh, position will be using also Galileo together with other GNSS. And we are also discussing at United Nations level an harmonization of uh, a different uh, initiative of emergency call proposing a multi-GNSS solution including Galileo. And it will not go in every, only in every car, but also in every truck. So this is thanks to digital tachograph. It's a device that improves the road safety, registering the time of driving and rest to respect the EU legislation. This device will not only be enabled to Galileo, but also require increased robustness and trustability. And for this reason, we think it's a typical application for the authentication you heard about that Galileo will be offering in the coming years. And finally, let me quote that Galileo has been recognized by the International Maritime Organization for the use in the regulated vessels. So it can be already used today. And we uh, believe that this will also generate a snowball effect on the small uh, recreational uh, vessels. So let me conclude uh, with an outlook on the future and the R&D opportunities, the research and development opportunities that we can offer. So uh, we, you heard about the authentication. So the authentication is a differentiator that Galileo will bring, um, and it's the ability of the system to guarantee to the user that the signal is really coming from the Galileo satellites and not from any other source. It's not spoofed. So we have in mind the two kinds of authentication, an authentication for professional users in the form of a spreading code encryption in the frame of the commercial service, and the second authentication that is uh, on the open service, so on the free one, on E1, on the main frequency, and is in the form of a navigation message authentication, so a sort of digital signature of the signal. So this second one, uh, we think it will be really important for all the emerging mobile payment, uh, online gaming, uh, and other applications that make use of the position and want uh, a trusted position. 
and it will be already available in 2018, so a bit later of the initial services for experimental service, while the other authentication in the frame of the commercial service will come later on. But if you want to know something about the future, we have also uh, recently published uh, our first user technology report. So following the success of the uh, market report, that is a, uh, a yearly publication of the GSA, we wanted to go inside uh, the receiver and the devices uh, technology to see what is uh, now changing and what will be the innovation in the next decade. So if you want uh, to know something more and you also want to send uh, uh, us your feedback, please have a look to this uh, uh, publication. So finally, uh, as I said, for the companies who want to innovate in GNSS and especially leveraging uh, Galileo, uh, we, have, uh, uh, we are managing at GSA on behalf of the European Commission two programs for research and development. The first one is Horizon 2020 and is dedicated to application development. And we have today an open call for 33 million euros. The deadline is March 2017, so you are on time to participate and to propose uh, your innovative application that will join the 40 projects that we are already running today. The second uh, program is dedicated to receiver development, it's called Fundamental Elements. We want here to trigger innovative receivers and chipset uh, that address the main market segments and make use of Galileo Differentiator. We have an overall envelope of 111 million euro and seven new calls will be published by the end of next year, so keep a look on our website if you are interested in innovation. So with this I conclude my introduction and I give back uh, the word to Deimos. Thank you, Fiametta. All right, uh, so let's move on to our final panelist, who uh, is uh, Peter uh, Groniar, who is the CEO of Talus Alenia Space Leuven in Belgium. In 2000, he co-founded Septentrino Navigation, a designer and manufacturer of GNSS receivers based in uh, Leuven, Belgium, and served as its CEO until 2014. From 1994 to 1998, he was the Science and Technology Counselor for the Embassy of Belgium in the United States. He received an MS in Computer Science and Engineering from the uh, uh, Freya University in Brussels, Belgium, and an MS in Aeronautics from the California Institute of Technology, Caltech. Uh, Peter, I will hand it over to you. Uh, good morning, good evening, everybody. Uh, thanks, Emos, for the uh, kind introduction. Uh, I'd like to start congratulating the Galileo program uh, for this uh, new important milestone, which is the Galileo Initial Services. I think it's fair to say that we have come a very long way since the first signal reception on uh, January 12, 2006, when the GOVA spacecraft was the only bird in the sky singing uh, Galileo songs. So today there are 18 spacecraft uh, that are orbiting and uh, we look forward to uh, four more spacecraft in 2017, uh, four more to be launched in 2018, and uh, another eight uh, that will become available, as you can see uh, here. Um, um, I as you can see here on this uh, on this slide. So uh, what you see on the photo is uh, is the first waveform that uh, we picked up uh, early 2006, uh, and that was an important, a very important milestone. Um, what I'd like to uh, to explain in my presentation is uh, how Galileo Initial Services uh, respond to uh, current needs uh, in the market and how they will continue to do so for new needs in the market in a couple of years from now. And I'd like to bring that from a uh, user perspective. I'm a little biased towards the professional user market. But what you can see on this slide is uh, the bipolar uh, simplified uh, view of the user segments. You have the professional uh, segment uh, in the upper right corner. Uh, high accuracy, high integrity, high complexity uh, are common uh, for uh, maritime survey, precision agriculture, and uh, integrity is important for aviation users. That represents about 10% of the market. And for mass market users, um, uh, such as Broad and LPS, 
uh, who together represent about 90% of the total GNSS markets, um, the uh, most important uh, criteria are uh, cost, power consumption, size, and not so much uh, the accuracy that is required. So what Galileo does today uh, with this uh, initial phase is really respond very well to, um, uh, to, to more satellites, uh, more signals. So uh, what Galileo does is adding more spacecraft and more frequencies uh, to uh, a very rich set of uh, constellations that allow uh, users to uh, get a very stable and a very uh, precise uh, PVT. And obviously it's not only about uh, Galileo, but there's also the other systems uh, like GPS, uh, GLONASS and Beidou that are not adding new capabilities uh, to, uh, to what we can see uh, in the sky. Um, so that perfectly uh, responds and caters to the needs of today's um, users. Uh, this is made uh, clear on, uh, on this slide. This was actually recorded in 2014 uh, in an urban canyon. And what you can see is the skyscrapers uh, and uh, four, uh, uh, the, f the four constellations. Uh, you see two GPS spacecraft, two Galileo spacecraft, one Beidou and one Klona spacecraft. And what they allow you to do is just go to get a good PVT, which wouldn't be possible with any single system. But moreover, uh, by combining all those uh, uh, systems, you can actually narrow down uh, and, and reduce the error, uh, which is of importance, obviously, to, uh, uh, to professional users. Um, there's, been, uh, uh, there's been more recent uh, tests, um, like the one uh, that you see on this slide. Uh, this is uh, um, some, some, some footage of a recent uh, test campaign uh, conducted over Africa. Uh, there's a test, there was a test flight from Dakar in Senegal uh, to the city of Lomé in Togo uh, on board a small spacecraft, uh, on board a small aircraft and uh, the, um, the availability of spacecraft was so good that it was possible to calculate the PVT just using Galileo, Galileo signals. And um, so with this uncorrected uh, standalone uh, Galileo PVT, uh, we were able to get an, a positioning error uh, of, of about two meters in the horizontal plane and about six meters along uh, the vertical axis, uh, very much in line with the specifications uh, of the system. So uh, this shows you that uh, if you were to combine it with other systems, you would uh, get even better uh, performance. So uh, I've explained that uh, uh, Galileo perfectly replies to the needs uh, in the market today. Uh, I believe that uh, tomorrow uh, the user market uh, will, be, uh, will become much more complex. So not only accuracy and integrity will be important criteria, but also uh, some sort of protection against spoofing, so authentication will become a, a third uh, important uh, dimension. And uh, depending on the needs, uh, you will have a professional or a mass market application. And for instance, road with the, the rise of uh, intelligent vehicles, uh, you will see that road will uh, have needs in terms of uh, accuracy, in terms of integrity but certainly also in terms of uh, authentication. It, it will have to be spoof-proof because you, you don't want to want anybody tamper uh, with the position uh, of your car uh, that drives automatically. So that will become an important feature. And uh, that's what uh, Galileo also will uh, offer. Um, as you can see on, on the next slide, uh, the spoofing uh, threat has gained uh, recent attention, as you can see in this newspaper article in the Japan Times. And, and what Galileo will do against that is offer some layers of defense. Uh, the open service uh, will, be, uh, will be enriched with an authentication message. The commercial service, which will be uh, aimed at uh, professional users, will have a stricter and, 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 a, and a stronger level of uh, 
protection against spoofing and obviously uh, for uh, authorized users PRS uh, will be uh, will be providing protection against uh, spoofing. Um, my guess would be that uh, in, in the face of those new threats and challenges uh, other signals and other systems uh, will follow suit uh, to provide uh, protection and obviously um, integrity uh, will continue to be uh, a, a very important uh, feature and uh, the, uh, the offering of an integrity monitoring service uh, in the next phase uh, of the Galileo system uh, will obviously uh, be important uh, for users around the world. So uh, this is my brief view on uh, what I believe to be uh, important about Galileo today and tomorrow. And uh, with that, I hand over to uh, Demos again. Thank you. Right. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Peter. All right. So before we move on to the last Q and A session, let's uh, do. Let me uh, let's, uh, let's say a little bit about next steps. Uh, the uh, the presentation, uh, the the webinar that you just saw today, will be available afterwards as a PDF on the Inside GNSS uh, uh, website. The address is given there, uh, and also we've provided contact info for our um, for our panelists. So if you have questions or things that you may want to know more about, uh, the, the contact info is given there. All right, so it's, uh, again, thank you very much for all the questions that you're sending in. Uh, if we don't get to all of them, uh, we will, um, we'll try to get to all of them, but I'm, I, I don't think we'll be able to get to all of the questions uh, in the time um, allotted here. But anyway, so the first one is for you, Fiametta. It is, are there any plans for uh, transmitting uh, Galileo corrections or providing Galileo corrections on EGNOS? Uh, okay, thanks for the question. Um, yes, we are already um, uh, planning the next generation of EGNOS that will be multi-frequency and multi-constellation and will correct also Galileo. It will come in the next years and we are already preparing both the system and the receivers to make use of this uh, capability. All right. Uh, do, uh Peter or Jeremy or Marco want to add anything to that or are you uh... all right uh, next question is for um, for Jeremy and it is uh, I guess uh, one of our uh, uh, audience wants to get a little bit more detail or a little bit more understanding on the high precision services can you say a little bit more about that okay thank you for the question so the high precision services um, foreseen in Galileo will be delivered in 2018. It's part of uh, the so-called commercial service. So the, the principle is that we will send in the E6 uh, message some uh, correction based on precise point positioning. Uh, compared to what is available today on the market, usually you have similar services, but they are delivered using telecommunications, satellites, typically uh, links. In that case, the correction will be delivered by the Galileo signals themselves. So there will be a kind of internal uh, feed feedback in the system. And uh, with the PPP, we can achieve, uh, so the precise point positioning, we can achieve really uh, very good accuracy, a few centimeters level. The question is the time to, to, um, to resolve the ambiguity, so the convergence time. And uh, it looks like, thanks to the multiple frequency nature of, uh, of Galileo, the, the, the convergence time will be really uh, reduced compared to what is available today. So today is about 30 minutes, and we could go down to couple of minutes to get the initial uh, fix of uh, such uh, accurate position. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, Marco, anything you want to add to that? Oh, it's okay. All right. Uh, next question. This one is for you, Peter. Uh, kind of a general question. Um, I, uh, I mean, uh, jamming and interference is always an issue for any GNSS. Um, are there things that are unique or um, uh, features on, um, on Galileo or how, I mean, can you say anything about jamming interference with respect to the Galileo signal? Well, 
uh, prote protection against jamming obviously is a moving target. Uh, it's something that uh, that you have to uh, uh, reply to as as as, uh, as it evolves. Uh, obviously, working uh, with more frequencies inherently gives you better protection. Uh, but uh, as far as I know, and uh, maybe I should uh, ask this to Mark or Jeremy, uh, there's no special protection for scene uh, in, in this respect. Um, but uh, as a general rule, the, uh, given that there are three uh, frequencies, uh, uh, E1, E5A and E5B, uh, that's obviously a, a much wider band uh, that uh, has to be jammed if anybody has bad intentions. So inherently that uh, gives you some uh, better protection than what you would have on, on a single frequency. Uh, Marco, would you have anything you want to add to that? Yes, I would. Uh, I think uh, this is a personal opinion, of course, and uh, <laughs> I'm open uh, to to objections. But um, Jeremy before mentioned the the capability of a commercial service to provide precise point positioning, which is fully true. But I think that uh, we might discover in the future commercial services mostly in, most interesting in the in terms of. Uh, protection against spoofing because uh, it will be for the first especially for uh, applications where you need to guarantee a synch timing uh, synchronization uh, uh, secure for critical infrastructure so the commercial services will provide a signal that is uh, encrypted so uh, intrinsically protected against against spoofing so this is going to be maybe in the future the most interesting feature of, uh, of Galileo uh, Jeremy, anything you want to add to that, or Fiametta? Yes, uh, I agree with Peter. It's uh, it takes more uh, resource to to jam uh, multiple frequency signals, and I would even add that the signals that are delivered are more powerful. So typically, compared to a current GPS signal minus 160 uh, uh, watts we are now maybe 5 dB above that in L1 and then you add up the E5 signal so definitely the, the jammer will need to, to look uh, bigger and uh, okay so we have uh, today all the chipset the major chipset are ready some of them are already embedded in a smartphone uh, you can buy on the market and an over the year update uh, will be available uh, and uh, all the new smartphone that will come from next year will have this capability on board. So this will be quick because of the replacement rate that we can observe uh, in this uh, in this field. Uh, for what concerns the transportation, probably automotive and road will be the first one to take on board uh, Galileo. And uh, with the equal uh, initiative I quoted before, we are giving a hand to this process. Uh, the, probably the one that will take more time are the regulated and standardized transportation applications such as the train control or the aviation that will require the time uh, to update uh, all the processes of uh, standard and certification. But uh, that's why we started to work on it uh, even before the, the Galileo initial services, uh, for example, with IMO recognition and uh, so on. All right. Um, next question. This one is for you, Jeremy. Uh, and uh, someone noted that in your uh, presentation you said something about SAR services uh, um, already being used since uh, uh, initial service to, uh, was uh, declared. Uh, can, you, can you say again exactly how many times and uh, um, what uh, that was used and um, if you can say a little bit more about uh, what the occasions were? Okay. Maybe I will start with the, the users. Uh, today, there are more than 1.4 million beacons in services around the world and about half of them are for use in maritime. So basically, any decent uh, uh, ship today, they have, uh, they have a Cospasar sat beacon equipped. Uh, they are as well uh, aviation users for 25% and land users for the other 25%. Um, so, since uh, the initial service declaration last week, 
actually on the 13th of December, that was at uh, 13 uh, continental time, at the start of the initial service. Just two minutes after, we got the first uh, distressed located, and it was a, a, a ship from Singapore, uh, which was actually located offshore of the South African uh, coasts. It was detected by the antenna in Toulouse, and immediately the distress was relayed to the relevant mission control center responsible of the region, which is actually the Australian uh, MCC. So that was the first alert uh, detected, and I think we will try to find the boat and give him a kind of middle for, <laughs> for, for, for the uh, remembering this important event. And since then, there were about 300 alerts. So in one week, 300 alerts were detected and localized using the MIOSAR. For your information, there are about 2,000 people that are rescued every year by the COSPASARSAT system. And thanks to this improvement in the system, uh, possibly we, we will be looking at increasing this number, maybe doubling it every year. All right, thank you. Uh, next one, this one is for you, Marco. Um, and I mean, I'm, uh, well, I guess Marco or Peter, let's start with Marco, and if Peter has something to add, uh, you could add later on. Uh, uh, now that you've got, uh, uh, I guess, many, uh, 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 many constellations up here that can provide you a position uh, fix, including Galileo, um, how, how, I mean, how is that done? Is there, does one have to have uh, some sort of, um, you know, synchronizing between, uh, or, or is that transparent to the user? Um, can you say something about having multiple uh, GNSS up there with Galileo now and how PBT calculations would be done? Yeah, okay, Demos. Uh, of course, uh, I mean, the, the, the receivers, I mean, to take into account the different satellites from different constellations requires uh, some added complexity to the receivers, but take into account that technology pro pro progresses so fast that uh, it is very easy to implement these uh, additional features in the receivers. In any case, Galileo in particular is uh, helping the receivers uh, do performing this, uh, this mix, this melange of uh, different satellites because, uh, for instance, as compared to, the, to GPS, we are uh, providing the steering, the time steering between uh, GPS and the Galileo satellites. So this would help uh, the, the receiver in converging and fixing, let's say, taking into account the different time uh, synchronization of the two constellations. Okay, uh, Peter, anything you want to add to that from the receiver side of the house? Yeah, so the, the as Marco said, the uh, GPS Galileo time offset is an important uh, feature that helps to, uh, to converge and uh, um, the, uh, the, the progress in, in technology um, certainly helps there as well. Uh, I can say that uh, uh, in, in my previous life we had, a, we had a receiver that was capable uh, of tracking uh, the four constellations uh, back in 2008 already. So uh, obviously you, get, you become better, you become smarter uh, to, uh, to, to industrialize it. And, uh, uh, but features like uh, the, the, the GPS GLONASS time offset certainly help uh, in making it more efficient and that uh, will help uh, make it more accessible uh, for, for the, the user, for the mass market, uh, mass market users as well. So uh, we're getting there. Okay. Um, anything you want to add to that, uh, Fiametta, perhaps? Or uh, yes, just to say that uh, what uh, was looking like um, a very innovative a few years ago to have uh, multiple constellations inside the receivers is now state of the art. So also in mass market receiver, uh, you have uh, multiple constellation. Now the challenge is uh, power consumption, but uh, I see that uh, most of the of the device manufacturer and chipset manufacturer they found a very smart solution also to to manage this problem. So it's a reality today. Okay. Jeremy, anything you want to add to that? I don't know. Thank you. 
All right, so related to that, this question is for you, Fiamita. It's, uh, can you say something about the level of uh, market penetration of Galileo ready, ready mobile devices and hardware? Um, and um, in our, um, I mean, is, is there a lot of them out there? And uh, are, they, are they, I mean, the ones that are out there, are they backward compatible? Is there a lot of modification that one would have to do to start receiving Galileo uh, services? Or what's the state currently? Uh, yeah, so as I was addressing uh, in my presentation, uh, 17 of the major companies who are delivering chipset, they have uh, Galileo inside uh, already today, so we do expect that uh, uh, the market penetration will grow very fast next year, especially in mass market, uh, because in other segments like uh, in uh, road or uh, in uh, professional is already good today. Uh, so. Um, can I use my smartphone I bought uh, for this Christmas uh, uh, to use Galileo? It depends on the model. Some models have already Galileo inside the today, but it's not activated because they were waiting for, for us to declare the initial services as we did now. So for some model it's possible an activation over the air, so they send an upgrade of the op uh, operating system and you can use Galileo. Uh, in other models this is not possible, but uh, it will come uh, very fast uh, in the the new models that will be on the market from next year. Thank you. Uh, Peter, anything you want to add uh, from the slide of a receiver? Uh, no, no, thank you. Okay. All right, uh, let's see. The next question here, I will... Uh, um, this one is uh, for for you, Peter, and um, it is on. I mean, you, you touched a little bit on on the integrity um, um, being better available, or uh, with Galileo uh, coming now being an additional GNSS there. Uh, again, can you say anything about? Um, can you say a little bit more about uh, about uh, about that aspect? Uh, what kind of what, what kind of, on the integrity with the GNSS is now GPS Galileo, etc. being available. Well, you can certainly, um, uh, if more systems uh, come online and if you can use them to compare uh, uh, PVTs, then that certainly helps uh, in terms of integrity. Uh, as was mentioned in, uh, in, in Marco's presentation, uh, the, uh, what was called the, the, the safety of life service uh, is, is, uh, has been uh, uh, renamed the integrity monitoring service, so um, once that becomes online, you certainly will get uh, uh, improved in, in integrity performance. And uh, I would expect that um, uh, with EGNOS uh, or as some of the SBAS systems becoming uh, multi-frequency, uh, that their services will be uh, uh, upgraded as well. So uh, from, from all the different angles, uh, having more systems uh, that you can combine, uh, having integrity monitoring uh, becoming available uh, on Galileo and seeing that the SBAS systems are being upgraded, that all is going to contribute to uh, to improved uh, integrity performance. Right. Uh, Marco, anything you want to add to that? No, thank you. All right. Uh, Jeremy? Uh, yes, maybe a few information regarding this uh, future integrity uh, monitoring services. So there are, there are quite some discussions uh, between the different service provider, in particular with, uh, with GPS, to provide uh, in the signaling space of uh, Galileo, but as well GPS and other GNSS, some information that will, in the future, help the receiver to have their own autonomous uh, receiver integrity monitoring. We call it the A-RAIN. So the message here is uh, uh, Galileo will uh, We'll push for it, and we will try to do it in, a, in full cooperation, international cooperation with all the other providers, so that uh, it is really seamless for the users in a multi-genesis constellation. All right. Let's see. Uh, next question. This one is uh, uh, for you, um, uh, Marco, and it's about the uh, Galileo constellation. Um, is the Galileo constellation such that the uh, 
coverage of satellites anywhere geographically is even, or is it like other GNSSs that have, I guess, more of a geographic preference in addition to global coverage? Can you say something a little bit more about the uh, yeah. Galileo constellation? Yeah, sure, Demos. The Galileo constellation is uh, conceived to be to not, not to prefer any geographical region. So it is a worldwide in its essence. It's similar, very similar from this point of view to the GPS one or the GLONASS one. And uh, so unlike, for instance, the Beidou system, we didn't uh, have any plan to prefer, let's say, Europe. Taking into account, this gives me the opportunity to mention again, it was already done, the fact that Europe took already steps to provide uh, another big uh, important infrastructure that is EGNOS to our P P overall PNT infrastructure. So we have already since many years operational EGNOS over Europe and, uh, and now we have Galileo that is going to be worldwide and as mentioned by Fiametta, the two will somehow further merge together so the, the a, a final offer of a European offer in terms of PNT to the world is in fact a combination of EGNOS and Galileo. And EGNOS of course is uh, at a time being uh, focused on Europe, but you know that there are several international cooperations also uh, about that. All right. Um, uh, this question is for you, Fiamedem. Um, and it is, in one of your slides you mentioned that with uh, Galileo for time synchronization all that one needs is one satellite. Um, can, can you say a little bit more? I mean, is that, I mean, that sounds novel to some that uh, I guess are not uh, familiar with that. And is that the case? And can you say a little bit more uh, how that works? Okay, yes. So um, GNSS, uh, GPS, but also other system, uh, today are used uh, to get the precise timing and not for the position, that was the, the first aim. And uh, this precise timing is used to synchronize uh, a network, for example, uh, telecommunication network, uh, like the mobile telecommunication network, uh, power distribution ones, and also to timestamp uh, banking transactions and uh, other finance uh, services. And uh, to do this, the GNSS is used either as a backup solution or also as a primary source in some cases due to the to low cost of the solution. So what I was saying is that Galileo we, is providing already now this uh, this timing. We saw the also the good performances uh, observed uh, presented by my colleague Jeremy. And uh, to do to have this timing is sufficient to have one satellite in view. While for the position we need at least four. So Galileo will be used. Uh, most probably in combination with other GNSS. Uh, for timing, we can get uh, uh, the timing uh, from the Galileo satellite. So it can be a valuable backup solution already today to, for example, to when GPS is used, Galileo can be a valuable backup uh, immediately from the initial services. Right, right. All right, again, thank you very much, uh, audience, for all the questions you sent, but we, we're going to have to stop at, at this point, and I will hand it over to Lori for, for some final words here. Okay, thank you, Demos, and uh, folks, before we sign off, a thank you to each of you for joining us, and trust you found today to be of value, as well, special thanks to our distinguished panel members and, of course, our sponsor, Novatel and co-hosts inside GNSS and inside Unmanned Systems, and uh, again, thanks for joining. This is Lori Dearman saying, hope we see you on the next one. Bye for now.